Hi. Oh, excuse me. Hi, cats. Um, this is going to be about thermodynamics. Um, so first, I'll start with some of the basics. Make sure you understand that temperature is really just it's a measure of how fast molecules are moving and we'll talk more about that in a little bit but temperature that's really what temperature is where heat is energy uh, and it is energy that can move hence thermodynamics heat that's moving okay um, that's really the whole point of this. So the whole point of this unit is, hey, if we have heat that's moving, can we tap into it and do some work? Okay. Um, remember, this is super duper important. The If you have something that is hot and something that is cold, that heat unassisted goes that way. So heat moves that way. And it keeps moving that way until you end up with something where the two objects have the same temperature and then the heat would stop flowing because it doesn't need to keep going. Um, this is called the zeroth law of thermodynamics, which some people, um, some amazing physics teacher call the duh law of thermodynamics because Hey, guess what? Heat goes from hot to cold, duh, and, and it keeps going from hot to cold, duh, until it ends up being warm and warm. Uh, now, there, in order for the heat to move, okay, there are three ways that heat can move. Conduction, and this is literally just touching something else, and when the two objects touch, the heat transfers. Um, make sure you understand what happens when the heat transfers, that it's really causing the molecules to move faster, going along with this idea of temperature. Um, but that's conduction. There is convection. Convection, like a convection oven, uses a fluid in a convection oven. That fluid would be air uh, to move the heat. So convection, you have to have a fluid that would transfer the heat. And then the last way is radiation. And this is why there is life on the Earth, because there is lots of heat transferred from the sun to us via radiation. Okay, um, so those are the three things there. Um, we started with, you know, this type of stuff where it's like, hey, which is really hot, cold stuff. Um, if you remember... We had a piece of aluminum, and then we had a piece of foam, and they were painted to kind of look the same, and then we put an ice cube on top, and, well, first, before we put the ice cube on top, you touch the aluminum, you touch the foam, and the aluminum felt colder, and then you put the ice cube on it, and the ice melted way faster, and the reason that the ice cube melted way faster here, even though they were both starting at the same temperature, which was room temperature, was because of this equation. And this equation is on your formula sheet. Okay, where just so again, this, this equation would be on your formula sheet, and so hopefully make sure you can locate it. But this is the rate that heat transfers. K is the thermal conductivity for the substance. So the reason that aluminum felt colder at the start, it had a larger K value than foam did, meaning heat transfers better through the aluminum than foam. A is just the area that is uh, in contact. Change in temperature is the change in temperature between the two things, and L is the length of it. So um, if there is questions like, hey, you go outside in the wintertime and you touch a metal pole versus you go outside in the wintertime and you touch a tree, 
it feels like the metal pole is colder. Okay. Uh, is it actually colder? It is not there, both at the, whatever temperature the outside is, uh, but it feels like it's colder because the metal has a higher thermal conductivity, so therefore it is taking more heat from you. Okay, so remember, if you feel warm, that means heat is coming to you. If you feel cold, that means heat is leaving you. Okay, but just make sure you are okay with this equation and it makes sense and you can relate it back to that activity from there. So that was kind of the first stuff, uh, what is heat and zeroth law and that stuff. Then we got into this idea of pressure because if we are talking about a gas, and just remember that pressure is still equal to force over area, just like from fluids, okay? But if I have a container, and this container is full of gas, well, these molecules are going to be, you know, bumping into the sides. When the molecules bump into the sides, they exert a force over, an, and there's going to be a certain area, so, like, they're exerting pressure on the sides, okay? And we derive this, and you don't need to know how to derive it, but just understand really what's happening is that Hey, this molecule, when it bounces off, okay, there's a change in momentum there, which then causes F times T, and you could work it out. Uh, but eventually, we got this idea of this microscopic thing, which is molecules moving around, can affect this macroscopic thing, which is pressure. Okay, um, and the the average kinetic energy of the molecules is going to be 3 halves kb times t. Um, and again, that would be on your equation sheet, so make sure you can locate it. Uh, if you remember, kb is Boltzmann's constant, which is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd. Again, that is on your formula sheet. And the units would be joules per Kelvin. So remember, you need to have that in Kelvin. Um, remember to convert from Calvin to Celsius, you just add 273. Um, remember, this is equal to, also kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mv squared, and that is yes on your formula sheet. Um, and then we did these graphs from that, hopefully you remember, where we had these graphs where it was, hey, look. The, this is the number of molecules, and then this is the speed. Well, if I have, for example, uh, you know, hot gas and then cold gas, well, if you look, and really what this equation is saying is that at the same temperature, all gases are going to have the same average kinetic energy. They are not saying all gases will have the same molecules, will have the same speed, because if you look, it depends on the mass. So let's say you have hot, cold, and I wanted to graph that. Well, the hot one would look something like this, because there are going to be more molecules moving faster like this would be the average, uh, where the cold one would look something more like this. And if I drew it correctly, the area under each, each of those graphs would should be the same, uh, assuming it's the same number of molecules. Um, or if I had, instead of hot and cold, if I have the same temperature, so again, this one would be hot, that would be cold. It, if I had the same temperature, so they're the same temp, but this is, for example, oxygen, and this is hydrogen. Well, hydrogen has a much smaller mass, so therefore those molecules are moving faster. So this smaller curve would be more like the curve for hydrogen, and then this larger curve would be more like the curve for oxygen. So uh, hopefully that makes sense. I would make sure you guys go back and review that. And then, honestly, the rest of the unit was pretty much RPV diagrams. Okay, so 
make sure that you are okay with these two formulas. And again, that's on your formula sheet, okay? But just as a reminder, this is moles. Remember to mo number of molecules, and this is number of molecules. Remember that Avogadro's number, there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules per mole, okay? So you can really convert easily back and forth. Uh, R, is, as long as in where you'll be doing it in joules, that R is equal to 8.31 joules, and then this is just moles times Kelvin, um, and then K we already did from before. So just make sure you're okay with that. Remember, this is in Kelvin. Um, that uh, we did lots and lots of problems with our PV diagrams. First thing I just want to remind you that the area underneath here, okay, that area is going to be pressure times volume, which is P times V, okay, which really is energy. So like in our equation here, P times V is energy. How do I know that? Because this is a Newton per meter squared. This is meters cubed. And so I get Newtons times meters, which is a joule, which is energy. So just make sure that that makes sense, um, which is also why on the equation sheet, this is there where it says uh, negative P change in V, but more with that in just a little bit. Because um, again, hey, look, there you go. All right. But... Uh, we did first law of thermodynamics, and then we'll go through. I'll go through a couple examples with you. First law of thermodynamics was this one, and yes, that's on your equation sheet. Um, but essentially, you know, with this, if you have a question where it's something like, you know, PV. So let's say I have something where I don't know. It goes like this. Okay. Well, if it goes like that, if you were to do your delta u q work if you look there's no work that's done why because the volume hasn't changed you have to have movement to have work or if you like there's no area so that would be zero well geez my pressure went up so if you think about our equation here if this goes up and that stays the same well that means my temperature had to go up so that means that this had to go up because remember delta u is really the it's three halves n k b t which is really just n times the number times the average kinetic energy okay that form is not there but you should understand that because our kinetic energy formula from before was for one molecule so if you want to find the energy stored in the whole thing you just multiply by the number of molecules um, so in this case, my temperature goes up. If my temperature goes up, this is going to be positive, which then means, hey, look, that means I added heat to my gas, okay? Um, if you had, I don't know, let's say if you had PV where it's an isothermal, okay? And let's say it's going that way, delta U, Q, and W. Well, in this case, my volume is going up, that means the gas is doing the work. If the gas is doing the work, that means the gas is losing energy, which means this is negative. But if you go back to this equation, if this is positive, then that makes this negative. Okay. Um, there is no change in temperature, so therefore that has to be positive. In fact, the size of this would have to be equal to the size of that. So just make sure you Go back and look at that stuff again because that's obviously super duper important. Um, we talked about uh, cycles. So, for example, if you have a complete cycle like this, so let's say it goes this way and then it goes this way and then it goes this way and then it goes this way, it goes this way uh, that if you have a cycle like this, you know, we could do. 
all of this stuff. And then if I labeled my points A and B and C and D, okay, you know, we could say, hey, if I when I was going from A to B and B to C and C to D uh, and then D back to A. And then if I have like kind of the whole thing, the net, so once I go all the way around, well, that has to be zero. And the net work, okay, would be the area inside this. So that whatever that area is, that would be that net work. And then if that's zero, then you can figure out your Q, uh, which in this case, because I'm going to have more work going out, this network would be negative, which means this would have to be positive. Um, and then if we were to do our equation or our other picture, if you remember, so if this was hot and this was the cold, according to our zeroth law, heat's going to flow from hot to cold. Well, if I put my engine here, I can tap into that where this would be my Q coming in, this would be my Q going out, and then this would be the work. And then I have this amazing equation here, which, which would be Q in equals Q out plus work. But again, don't memorize, think about your picture and then figure it out. Um, but all of these Q ins would be any Q's that are positive here. Any of the Q outs would be any Q's that are negative here. And then your the the work that is you get out would be what this value here would be. That would be your total work. Um, and then you could solve stuff. So the hot for this one, the hottest would be whatever temperature this is because that's the biggest P times V. The cold would be whatever temperature that is. Um, but again, make sure that you can set up this and solve it because it is super duper de duper important. Um, in fact, you know what? I'm going to do pluses and minuses right now just because it is that important. So if you look, I'm increasing my temperature. So this is plus. I am increasing my volume. So that means the gas is doing work. So that's going to be minus. So if this is plus and that's minus, this has to be an even bigger minus number. From B to C, my temperature is going down, so that's negative. B to C, I'm doing no work. So therefore, this number and this number would have to be the same, and they both be negative. C to D, I, my temperature is going down. That's going to be negative. Uh, C to D, that's going to be positive work, so, so energy is added to the, to the gas. Well, if this is negative and this is positive, this has to be a bigger negative number. And then here to here, uh, hang on, whoops, this one has to be a bigger positive number. I screwed that up. Let's go back, sorry. If this is if this is positive, that's negative. This has to be positive, my bad. Um, let me make sure I did this, everything else here. This is negative, positive, so this has to be a bigger negative. That That's good. And then D to A, my temperature is going up. There's no work done, so that therefore this has to be the same as that. Um, in this case, these two Qs are going to win out because this negative is going to win out, and you would have a negative work being done there. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, these are all examples of irreversible processes because... All of these are, you know, it's going hot to cold. Like it's not, it, you're, you're not going to go back and forth. Um, so those would all be examples of irreversible processes. Remember, the most efficient engine is one that all of the process, processes are reversible. Okay. Well, what are the two different reversible processes we have? One was isothermal, where it was warm and warm, meaning it's just as likely for the heat to flow left as it is to flow right. And the other one was adiabatic, okay, which means, adiabatic means no heat transfer. 
okay? So if you have a completely reversible engine, okay, which was our Carnot engine, it would look something like this, where you have an isothermal, there's my one of my, my hot isothermal, here's my cold isothermal, and then I would have to go from this isoline to this isoline. How do I do that? Well, I do that with a steeper curve, and that steeper curve would be my adiabatic. So it would be it would be isothermal, adiabatic, isothermal, adiabatic. Okay, um, and if I was to do the you know, this we could do the same thing. Um, just make sure you're okay with doing this. I'm not going to go through it all this time, but make sure that it makes sense. Uh, also remember, so that would be a, a reversible engine. Um, remember, a reversible engine is the most efficient engine. But remember, you know, if you go back to this picture, remember, you always have to have this cue out. You can never just go all here to here, so your engine is never gonna have 100% efficiency, okay? Um, and then last thing we talked about was entropy in the unit. Uh, and remember, entropy tells us, typically if a, if a process is perfectly reversible, then the entropy stays the same. <coughs> if the process is not reversible, uh, then, um, it's chances are the entropy is going up, <coughs> but the second law of thermodynamics says the entropy for a closed system either has to stay the same or go up. Um, remember also that uh, entropy is kind of which way time flows. So, you know, if I just have something like this where it's hot and then cold, and then I have warm and warm well over time if i start with this and i just leave it by itself it's not going to spontaneously go to that so that this process here has more entropy than this okay or another way to think about it this has more usable energy this has less usable energy so higher entropy lower entropy um so yeah Hopefully that's pretty much all of it. That would be thermodynamics in about 23 minutes. Buckets!